Hello and welcome to the Hard Report. I'm your host, Edward Hardy, and today I'm joined by Philip Davies, Conservative Member of Parliament for Shipley. Philip, thank you for joining me. Pleasure. Let's start with, I note that you enjoy horse racing, you're an owner and a breeder. What do you think about the recent announcement that horse racing coverage is going to go from Channel 4 to ITV? Uh, I think it's the right decision. Um, it's quite sad in some respects because Channel 4 is synonymous with racing. Um, and it's been broadcasting it for years. And, I, and when, when Channel 4 got all of the racing from the BBC, I very much supported that too. Um, but the audiences have been in decline. It's become quite dull, the coverage, and so it needs freshening up. And um, hopefully ITV will do that. So I think, I think it was the right decision. You've talked in the past about treating male and female criminals differently, could be breaking discrimination laws. Do you think that they are being treated differently? Well, there's no doubt they're being treated differently. That's not, that's not in dispute. Um, if you look at the figures from the Ministry of Justice, for every single category of crime, a man is more likely to be sent to prison for committing that crime than a woman. They will be sent to prison for longer than a woman, and they will serve more of their sentence in prison than a woman. So there's no argument about the fact that the uh, criminal justice system is biased against men. Um, the question, I suppose, is whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but there's no argument about the fact that, um, that the, the system is more stricter on male criminals than female criminals. Do you think it should be equal? Yes, I believe in equality. And I, I don't believe in this, we want equality but only when it suits agenda. Mm -hmm. Either you, you believe in equality or, or you don't. And, and I do believe in equality, uh, that people should be treated the same. We should be gender blind, we should be colour blind, uh, we should deal with the crime that's been committed. So, uh, yeah, I think they should be treated the same. On that area, inequality and gender inequality, you said that often the problems of gender inequality stirred up by those who might be described as militant feminists and politically correct males who sometimes pander to it. And as well as that, the problem is virtually everything we do in the House of Commons and debate seems to start with the premise that everything is biased against women. That was heavily criticised by individuals such as Maria Miller, chair of the Women and Equality Select Committee. Could you explain those remarks? Well, you only have to watch the proceedings in the House of Commons, the things that we debate. I mean, we have a debate every year on, on International Women's Day um, without any controversy. Nobody's ever kicked up a fuss that we have that debate. But when I mentioned that we should, why don't we have a debate for International Men's Day, um, there was all hell to pay. I mean, I, you know, I was treated as if I was uh, worse than Donald Trump. Uh, by people in the in the house, uh, we have women and equality questions every month in Parliament. Uh, do we have questions about men's issues in Parliament? No, we don't. Mm. Um, so uh, you only have to watch the proceedings of the House of Commons to know that the, the that we do have this agenda, which basically seems to think that uh, women are sort of downtrodden and, and put upon, and, and men are always in the ascendancy. Um, and there are some issues where w women's issues need to be taken seriously. Um, but there are equally men's issues that need to be taken seriously as well, and, and I don't see why one should be a priority over the other. They're both important. Do you not believe that there are some areas where women are still treated unfairly, though, for example, receiving less pay in the workplace for doing the same work as their male counterpart? Yes, there are, there are, there are issues where uh, women are uh, disadvantaged. I, I don't dispute that. I've never, never said uh, otherwise. Um, and they, those issues need to be uh, addressed. Uh, but then it doesn't mean to say, it doesn't therefore follow that that means that men haven't got issues where they're disadvantaged that need to be addressed as well. Right? We should be gender blind when it comes to it, should we look at the issue and it shouldn't be, well, well we'll have a look at it because a woman's disadvantaged, but if a man's disadvantaged we're not interested. That, that can't be an acceptable way to behave. You're the most rebellious Conservative MP, you certainly were in the, the last Parliament, you voted against the whip over a hundred times. Why do you believe you are out of step with your party's leadership? Well, look, the, w in the last Parliament we had a coalition with the Lib Dems um, and uh, for whatever reason, uh, David Cameron and the party leadership decided that that was the best thing for the Conservative Party and, and it was in the national interest and that's a, it's a perfectly legitimate position for them to, to hold and, and therefore they felt that in order to deliver that they had to compromise on what they believed in in order to deliver a truly coalition government. I wasn't elected in, in, in that 2010 election as a coalition MP, I was elected as a Conservative MP. 
Um, I made certain promises to my constituents about the things that I would campaign on if I was elected to Parliament. Uh, and when I was elected to Parliament, it would be dishonest of me to say at that point to my constituents, oh, well, I know that I got elected under this particular banner and on this particular mandate, but I'm going to ditch all of that in order to pursue this coalition. All I did really was consistently stand up for the things that I'd argued for before the election. Um, and so it's not really a question of asking me why I was consistent. The, the question really is why so many of my colleagues were prepared to ditch what they'd stood up for to their, before their electorate at the 2010 election. Why do you believe they were willing to ditch? What well, because they wanted to be in government. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm not an anarchist. I, I believe in governments and people need to be in government and all the rest of it. But, um, you know, I, I've always made it clear that um, I, I would never accept a, a government role. I would always stay on the back benches to argue for what I believed in. So um, I was merely being consistent about the things that I'd always argued for. It was the government that, and the party leadership that had changed its stance on things, not me. You've been called a defender of the privileged by individuals in the press. Why do you think they call you that and how do you respond? I have no idea. I didn't know I was called the defender of the privileged. Um, I'm the most unlikely defender of the privileged, uh, to be perfectly frank. I think there's much more likelier candidates for defending privilege in the Conservative Party in Parliament than me. Um, I don't even consider myself to be from a particularly privileged background. but. Um, I don't know. I, I suspect it's a form of abuse that people hurl at you if they don't agree with you. In the debates over the refugee crisis, you wrote in an email to a constituent, I believe it was a constituent, that it's frankly pathetic to suggest that you can only show you have compassion by thinking we should take everyone who comes here. What do you see as the compassionate response to the refugee crisis uh, and why did you say that? Well, it wasn't a constituent actually, but it, it was a, it was a, um, the compassionate thing to do is to be realistic about what you can deliver. Um, I mean, it, we, you have this ridiculous auction, to be perfectly honest, that goes on, where, uh, where when we first started with it, the Prime Minister said that we weren't going to take anybody, um, the Labour Party said we should take 10,000. Then the Prime Minister announced that we were going to take 20,000, and the same people in the Labour Party said, well, that wasn't enough. So you end, you end up with this situation that whatever you say, for some people, whatever it is, it will never be enough. If we'd have said 100,000, they'd have said it should be 200,000. If we said 200,000, it should have been half a million. You can never appease the people who just, their, their starting point is, you should always do more. My view about what's compassionate is about uh, be, actually giving people some help. People who had already got to Europe were already safe. They were already in a safe country. We can't make them any more safe. Um, so that's just gesture politics. Um, and the other thing is, is that we're already struggling to house people in our own country. I have people coming to my surgeries every single week, struggling to get housed. Um, and so where on earth are we going to find the houses for all of these other people that we're already taking? They don't, they don't exist. And so it's no good making rash promises that you can't deliver on. That's not compassionate. That's just trying to look as if you're compassionate. Being really compassionate is saying, what can we do practically to help people? What's realistic to uh, offer? And then let's deliver on it, rather than just making a, um, a, a gesture politics um, offer that, that sounds good, but in reality will never be delivered. What do you think the, that Britain should be doing to help with the refugee crisis and help to resolve it if you don't think they should be taking everyone who wants to come here? Well, we should fulfil our international obligations, which is that if somebody arrives in this country uh, as the first port of call and seeking refuge, um, we should process their application, and if they are genuinely fleeing refuge, uh, seeking refuge and fleeing persecution, we should take them in. That's what we've always done as a country, that's what we should always do. But we, what we can't do is we can't say to every other country in the world, I know you've got some refugees you don't want to deal with, we'll take them off your hands. Um, we should do what we've always done, which is to fulfil our international obligations and expect other countries to fulfil their own international obligations. And you think 20,000 is the right amount of refugees we should be accepting then? Well, I think it's quite high. I mean, I, I don't know where they're all going to go. Um, I mean, I, if somebody can tell me where in Shipley there's all the spare housing for all the refugees, then I, I'm, I, good luck to them. But I don't know where I don't know where this is. It may well be that in other parts of the country there's plenty of spare housing. I'm just not aware of it. I keep being told that we're not building enough houses to keep up with the UK population. So if we're not doing that, how on earth can we be building enough houses to have 20,000 refugees on top of that? 
Um, it just seems unrealistic to me. But if the Prime Minister thinks we can find places for 20,000 people, then I'll trust him that we can. You've claimed that the nanny state got carried away over plastic bags. It was an article you wrote for the Yorkshire Post, I believe. What do you see as an appropriate level of state intervention? Minimum, wherever it's necessary. Um, you know, charging fire. If, if the problem is um, carrier bags being strewn all over the countryside, um, then charging somebody five pence is not going to change their habit. All they're going to do is buy a carrier bag for five pence and then throw it all over the countryside. So I don't even see what it's trying to deal with. If it's to reduce the usage of carrier bags, then that seems to me a rather pointless uh, exercise because actually I don't know about you, but I, at home I use my carrier bags as bins. Mm. And so if I, can't, if I haven't got a carrier bag, I'm going to have to buy bin liners. Bin liners, uh, I'm told, are far more damaging to the environment than plastic carrier bags, and so again, it's it's a you know it's a something must be done kind of approach rather than actually thinking through logically is this something that we should do? If I go to the shop and I buy a load of stuff uh, and a load of expensive stuff, I would expect the shop to give me a bag free of charge to carry all the stuff I've, I I want. It seems to be unreasonable to to force the shop to charge you five pences. Um, state intrusion which is undesirable and unnecessary. So the state should act where it can make a difference, not just do something just for the sake of doing something. There are obviously going to be other areas that you believe is an appropriate level of state intervention. What would those be? Well, I'm, I'm a libertarian. I believe that people should be free to make their own choice. So, I mean, I don't believe in uh, restricting advertising on things. Um, uh, um, as we do at the moment, there's all this talk about uh, having a sugar tax um, and all these sorts of things. I, I don't believe these things. Let, let people make their own choices, I educate them. By all means, the government should educate people. But once they've told people that things are unhealthy, then let people make their own choice. They don't need the state interfering in, in every aspect of everybody's lives. Trust people to make decisions for themselves. We've recently seen devastating floods here in Yorkshire. And while the weather has subsided and the flood water has gone away, there was still significant damage to, to people's homes here. You've called for money that's been spent on the foreign aid budget to be diverted to helping those in the UK first. Could you explain this for you? Yeah, well, look, the way that a country should run, uh, in my opinion, is this, is that what you should do is you should say that... Um, what comes first is looking after people in this country. The British government's first duty should be to look after people in Britain. And it, once we've done that, if there's any money left over, then by all means let's spend it to help other people in other parts of the world who are less fortunate than we are. We've got ourselves into the exact opposite situation where we're guaranteeing a certain amount of money will be spent abroad and whatever's left we're then dividing up to spend in the UK. Well, that's got to be the wrong way around. When people suffer terrible natural disasters abroad, Britain has always been, and I hope it always will be, one of the first to respond and help out. Well, my constituents in Shipley suffered a natural disaster over Christmas, just as bad as a natural disaster anywhere else in the world. And so I want the government to spend as much money helping my constituents in Shipley as they would helping a flood victims in another part of the world with the overseas aid budget. I don't see why flood victims abroad are in some way a bit more special treatment than my constituents in Shipley when it comes to UK taxpayers' money. Uh, so all I say is let's look after our own people first and then whatever we've got left, let's help people abroad. But at the moment, we're doing it the other way around. Looking at victims of flooding, do you think more needs to be addressed when it comes to insurance companies that in stories of people where it says uh, in their contracts, an act of God means that you can't get a payout from your insurance company and that's being invoked when it comes to flood damage. Yeah, we've got, I mean, the government are introducing a, a system uh, from April, uh, flood re, it's called, and it basically um, means that everybody will pay a slight premium on their insurance cover in order to subsidise people who are in high flood risk areas to get affordable insurance. So the government are doing something to help. But yeah, there, there's definitely an issue with insurance companies uh, whether it's regards to trying to find some small print to get out of paying out or claiming that people haven't renewed their policy when they thought they had um, or whether it's just having insurance premiums which are just unaffordable to people um, and in those situations the, the, they are areas where the government have got to try and help people because we can't just leave people 
uh, it would to have homes that are flooded and have no way of, of claiming the money back. Now, are you familiar with a gentleman called Russell Howard? Yes. Have you seen the remarks he made about yes. you on television? Would you like to respond to them? Well, look, Russell Howard is a left winger who knows absolutely nothing about what goes on in Parliament, and ev virtually everything he put in his TV programmes was, was inaccurate uh, and was also defamatory, I might add as well. Um, so I'm currently in discussions with the Director General of the BBC about how they're going to correct the record because basically virtually everything that Russell Howard put in his programme was inaccurate um, and was merely just coming from a left-wing perspective and the BBC is supposed to be an impartial public service broadcaster. Uh, maybe somebody ought to tell Russell Howard that the BBC are supposed to be an impartial public service broadcaster. But look, he's, he, he, he might be a good comedian uh, but unfortunately his knowledge of Parliament and what goes on in Parliament uh, is nil. Talking about obviously the filibuster that led to that programme was regarding hospital parking charges, you were later found to have claimed parliamentary expenses for parking charges that you'd incurred in your role as an MP. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to individuals who see that as being a bit hypocritical uh, and how do you justify claims well, why, why is it hypocritical? Well, I mean, I've never, I've never said, I never opposed a bill that said people couldn't claim back their parking charges for work, for their course of their work. Mm -hmm. I've never, I, I never didn't, I didn't say that anybody who parks in any car park anywhere as part of the work shouldn't be able to reclaim it from their employer. That, that's it's completely irrelevant. And when I worked for ASDA, if I went somewhere and I incurred a parking charge, we claimed it back. Everybody, everybody who work, works in a job where they incur a, a charge claims it back. That, I, I've never argued, if, if I've ever argued that people shouldn't be able to do that, then that would be hypocritical. Mm -hmm. This was about a particular bill about carers claiming hospital parking charges. What, what Russell Howard either does, doesn't know because he's stupid or does, didn't point out because he wanted to be biased was that the bill would only have applied to one in six carers. So only one in six carers would have got free hospital parking. The other five out of six carers would in all likelihood have had to pay more for their hospital parking than they do already. Other disabled people would have had to pay more for their hospital parking charges than they do already. So how is one in six carers getting free parking and five out of six carers getting more expensive parking, how is that benefiting carers as a whole? I don't see that it does. Um, so the bill was completely misrepresented. It was totally unworkable. I mean, it, it, it applied to people who had an underlying entitlement to carer's allowance. I mean, how do you turn up to a car park and say, I've got an underlying entitlement to carer's allowance? How are the hospitals supposed to manage that process? It's, it's impossible. It was completely ill thought through. If there was a dispute as to whether or not they were entitled to free parking or not, who, who decided? Did, would, did, did the hospital have the final decision? Were we going to be creating a new car park ombudsman who decided any, any disputes between a, a person and it? None of these questions have been answered. Where was the money coming from? Were the government going to reimburse the hospitals for the free parking? Or was it going to come out of the hospital par hospital's budget? None of these, nobody knew the answers to these questions. Nobody had even thought through the bill. It was a ridiculous bill. It was a worthy sentiment, misrepresented, but it was a ridiculous bill. And in Parliament, it might be easy just to go with the flow, but we actually have a duty to make sure that the laws we pass are fit for purpose. And this bill did not pass any fit for purpose test. If anybody who bothered to read it would have known. Would you be willing to support a bill that was more clear, that supported all carers? Because of course you held that sign which said, I pledge to support carers. Yes, I think, uh, look, if, if uh, a bill which scrapped all hospital parking charges, mm. I would be more sympathetic to, because it would be simple and it would be um, easier to you know, enforce. Um, it wouldn't, again, there's some difficulties, because of course if a hospital is in a town centre, you don't want uh, everyone who shops in the town centre to be just parking free of charge in the hospital and clogging mm. up the parking spaces for people who actually need them. So it's not, it's not just as simple as that either, but... That bill was completely unworkable, but um, you know, I, I, I look at each bill on its merits, and if a, if a bill makes sense and it's affordable and it's desirable, then I'll support it. But I, I, you can't just say, I've got a, I've got a nice worthy idea, um, and we'll just nod it through without any scrutiny. That isn't really what Parliament's about. You've been called the master of filibuster. Do you believe it's an a appropriate method to use in debates, and why do you choose to use filibustering to make a point? 
Well, look, strictly speaking, filibustering isn't allowed in the UK Parliament. Mm. Uh, they use it in America where they can read out the telephone directory just to keep the debate going. In, in the UK Parliament, you can't do that. You've got to stick to the subject, you've got to keep on to the relevant part of the bill, you've got to, you can't repeat yourself. So we're, we don't filibuster, we speak at length. Um, and look, any MP um, in, in any party uses whatever parliamentary procedures are in place to try and achieve what they want to achieve. Um, any MP who could stop a bill that they thought was undesirable, but chose not to, would be bizarre. Uh, every MP uses whatever tools are at their disposal to get the outcome that they want, so um, I I'm certainly not going to apologise for doing that. Every MP does that. Um, if people want to accuse me of being effective, then yeah, I'll plead guilty to being an effective parliamentarian. Well, that's what my constituents pay me to do. Looking back at the issue of equality, you claimed in the past when it was being debated that the same-sex marriage bill had nothing to do with equality. Why do you believe that was the case? Well, it, because if you, we've now got a situation where uh, gay people can either have a civil partnership or a marriage, uh, whereas straight people can only have marriage. So that's clearly not equal. I mean, whether it's right or wrong, it's certainly not equal. Um, if you look at the gay marriage legislation, um, there is no definition of uh, consummating a marriage, uh, as there is uh, uh, in, in traditional marriage, so that's certainly not equal. Um, the definition of adultery, um, in, in, a, in, the, in the gay marriage bill, adultery is somebody uh, uh, having sex with somebody of the opposite sex. That's the definition of adultery in the gay marriage bill. So it's, it's clearly, a, clearly a nonsense. There's clearly no concept of adultery in gay marriage, in which there clearly is in traditional marriage. So whatever the rights and wrongs of uh, the same-sex marriage bill, um, people can argue about the merits of it, but they, they, they can't possibly claim it was about equality because the law certainly does not deliver equality. If those issues were ironed out within the bill, would you have been willing to support it? No, because it wasn't about e equality. Look, marriage to me, I'm not religious, mm. but to me marriage is a religious institution. I was very much in favour of civil partnerships because civil partnerships dealt with a problem in the law where, in effect, same-sex couples were being discriminated in the law in terms of assets and things when, when relationships broke down and all the rest of it, and in terms of uh, when people died in that relationship and all the rest of it. The civil partnership bill dealt with that uh, and, and made for true legal equality. Um, I, what I object to with the Gay Marriage Bill is that I envisage one day churches and other religious institutions being forced to hold gay marriages in their churches against their wishes. And to me that is intolerable to, to do that. And that's what I fear. Um, I, think it's, I, don't know, I don't think we need to get involved in, in, in a religious institution in the way that we have done. Uh, the state did the right thing with civil partnerships. That's where the state should have left it. The, the, the marriage bit really should be then left to religious institutions rather than the state forcing them on them. You've talked about being a libertarian. Do you think that the state should be entirely removed from marriage, so both for heterosexual and uh, homosexual couples? Yeah, the, 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 there's more of an argument for that. I mean, I, I, I would have more sympathy for that, that ju just to leave it as a religious institution um, and that the sta where, the, where the, 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 the state should recognise the legal implications of relationships. Um, but I think the, the marriage thing is probably, to my mind anyway, best left to churches. Another hot topic among the Conservative Party is the upcoming European Union referendum. You've criticised David Cameron's renegotiation strategy on the UK's membership of the EU. You warned that the British public will not be fooled by this farce of this renegotiation. Why did you describe his strategy as a farce? His strategy is not a farce, but the renegotiation is a farce. Because what's happened is, uh, David Cameron has already had the things that he's asked for agreed by all of the European parties. They agreed to these things ages ago. He would not have written in a document the things he wanted to see if he hadn't had them already agreed. He wouldn't have risked asking for something that was then turned down, because that would look like a failure. So it's perfectly clear the four things he wrote in his letter had clearly already been pre-agreed. Well, he, he couldn't just have a swift agreement announced because then everyone would accuse him of not asking for enough. So they had to manufacture this row where the EU looked at his letter and said, 
oh, you've gone too far this time, you can't possibly ask for all that, it's absolutely terrible and all the rest of it. And then David Cameron's going to battle away and eventually they're going to announce what they've already agreed. Oh, go on then, you can have the four things that you're asking for. So that David Cameron can then say sometime this year, look, my negotiations with a great triumph. It goes to show that if you engage in the, with the EU, you can win these battles. And all this, it's a sham. It's a sham show negotiation. Um, and that's what people won't be fooled by. He's not battling hard on a negotiation. It's already, been, it's already a done deal. We're just going through a choreographed row to make David Cameron look good when the, they finally ag publicly agree to what they've already privately agreed to. What would you want to see in a renegotiation? Well, nothing would satisfy me. I want to leave the EU. Um, but if it was a meaningful renegotiation, uh, David Cameron has been saying for years that Labour shouldn't have given up our rebate to the, that we used to get from the EU. So if it was a meaningful renegotiation, you'd think he would say, well, we want our rebate back. We want a reduction in the amount we hand over each year. Uh, but he's never asked for that. Why did he not ask for that? Because he knew they wouldn't agree to it. He's only asked for what he knows they've already agreed to. That's why the renegotiation is a farce. Um, but it, uh, it may well prove to be, you know, maybe it will be a successful strategy. I personally don't think that the UK public will be fooled by the renegotiation. You said nothing would convince you to stay in the EU. Why is that the case? Because we, we, all we want is free trade from, from Europe and we can have free trade for nothing. We don't need to hand over £19 billion pounds a year and have three quarters of our laws determined in Brussels to have free trade with Europe. We can have it for nothing. Uh, we have a £62 billion pound a year trade deficit with the EU. Uh, we buy far more from them than they buy from us. If we leave the EU, the UK will be the EU single biggest export market. So Germany are not going to stop selling us BMWs and Mercedes when we leave the EU. Uh, France are not going to stop selling us cheese and wine and champagne. Um, th th because we're the fifth biggest economy in the world and we are their single biggest market. So w w if we want free trade, let's have it for nothing. Why, why hand over a £19 billion pound a year membership fee for something that we can have for nothing? Philip Davies, thank you for joining me. Pleasure. Thank you for watching this episode of The Hardy Report. To let me know your thoughts or to continue the conversation online, tweet me at Edward T. Hardy using the hashtag The Hardy Report. If you'd like to see more, click the subscribe button to ensure that you're amongst the first to find out when new videos are released. Also, check out my social media links below to be kept up to date on everything to do with The Hardy Report. Until next time, goodbye. By those who might be described as militant feminists and politically correct males who sometimes pander to it. And as well as that, the problem is virtually everything we do in the House of Commons and debate seems to start with the premise that everything is biased against women. That was heavily criticised by individuals such as Maria Miller, chair of the Women and Equality Select Committee. Could you explain those remarks? Well, you only have to watch the proceedings in the House of Commons, the things that we debate. I mean, we have a debate every year on, on International Women's Day um, without any controversy. Nobody's ever kicked up a fuss that we have that debate. But when I mentioned that we should, why don't we have a debate for International Men's Day, um, there was all hell to pay. I mean, I, you know, I was treated as if I was uh, worse than Donald Trump uh, by people in the, in the House. Uh, we have women and equality questions every month in Parliament. Uh, do we have questions about men's issues in Parliament? No, we don't. Mm. Um, so uh, you only have to watch the proceedings of the House of Commons to know that, the, that, that we do have this agenda which basically seems to think that uh, women are sort of downtrodden and, and put upon and, and men are always in the ascendancy. Um, and there are some issues where w women's issues need to be taken seriously, um, but there are equally men's issues that need to be taken seriously as well, and, and I don't see why one should be a priority over the other. They're both important. Mm. Do you not believe that there are some areas where women are still treated unfairly though, for example, receiving less pay in the workplace for doing the same work as their male counterpart? Yes, there are, there are, there are issues where uh, women are uh, disadvantaged, I, I don't dispute that, I've never, never said uh, otherwise. Um, and they, those issues need to be uh, addressed. Uh, but then it doesn't mean to say, it doesn't therefore follow that that means that men haven't got issues where they're disadvantaged that need to be addressed as well. Right? We should be gender blind when it comes to it, should we look at the issue and it shouldn't be, well, well, we'll have a look at it because a woman's disadvantaged, but if a man's disadvantaged, we're not interested. That, that can't be an acceptable way to behave. 
Hello and welcome to the Hard Report. I'm your host, Edward Hardy, and today I'm joined by Philip Davies, Conservative Member of Parliament for Shipley. Philip, thank you for joining me. Pleasure. Let's start with, I note that you enjoy horse racing, you're an owner and a breeder. What do you think about the recent announcement that horse racing coverage is going to go from Channel 4 to ITV? Uh, I think it's the right decision. Um, it's quite sad in some respects because Channel 4 is synonymous with racing. Um, and it's been broadcasting it for years. And, I, and when, when Channel 4 got all of the racing from the BBC, I very much supported that too. Um, but the audiences have been in decline. It's become quite dull, the coverage, and so it needs freshening up. And um, hopefully ITV will do that. So I think, I think it was the right decision. You've talked in the past about treating male and female criminals differently, could be breaking discrimination laws. Do you think that they are being treated differently? Well, there's no doubt they're being treated differently. That's not, that's not in dispute. Um, if you look at the figures from the Ministry of Justice, for every single category of crime, a man is more likely to be sent to prison for committing that crime than a woman. They will be sent to prison for longer than a woman, and they will serve more of their sentence in prison than a woman. So there's no argument about the fact that the uh, criminal justice system is biased against men. Um, the question, I suppose, is whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but there's no argument about the fact that, um, that the, the system is more stricter on male criminals than female criminals. Do you think it should be equal? Yes, I believe in equality. And I, I don't believe in this, we want equality but only when it suits agenda. Mm -hmm. Either you, you believe in equality or, or you don't. And, and I do believe in equality, uh, that people should be treated the same. We should be gender blind, we should be colour blind, uh, we should deal with the crime that's been committed. So, uh, yeah, I think they should be treated the same. On that area, inequality and gender inequality, you said that often the problems of gender inequality stirred up... And so it's no good making rash promises that you can't deliver on. That's not compassionate. That's just trying to look as if you're compassionate. Being really compassionate is saying, what can we do practically to help people? What's realistic to uh, offer? And then let's deliver on it, rather than just making a, um, a, a gesture politics... Um, offer that, that sounds good but in reality will never be delivered. What do you think the, that Britain should be doing to help with the refugee crisis and help to resolve it if you don't think they should be taking everyone who wants to come here? Well, we should fulfil our international obligations which is that if somebody arrives in this country uh, as the first port of call and seeking refuge, um, we should process their application and if they are genuinely fleeing refuge, uh, seeking refuge and fleeing persecution we should take them in, that's what we've always done as a country, that's what we should always do. But we, what we can't do is we can't say to every other country in the world, I know you've got some refugees you don't want to deal with, we'll take them off your hands. Um, we should for, do what we've always done, which is to fulfil our international obligations and expect other countries to fulfil their own international obligations. And you think 20,000 is the right amount of refugees we should be accepting then? Well, I think it's quite high. I mean, I, I don't know where they're all going to go. Um, I mean, I, if somebody can tell me where in Shipley there's all the spare housing for all the refugees, then I, I'm, I, good luck to them, but I don't, know where, I don't know where this is. It may well be that in other parts of the country there's plenty of spare housing. I'm just not aware of it. Uh, I keep being told that we're not building enough houses to keep up with the UK population. So if we're not doing that, how on earth can we be building enough houses to have 20,000 refugees on top of that? Um, it just seems unrealistic to me, but if the Prime Minister thinks we can find places for 20,000 people, then I'll trust him that we can. You've claimed that the nanny state got carried away over plastic bags. It was an article you wrote for the Yorkshire Post, I believe. What do you see as an appropriate level of state intervention? Minimum, wherever it's necessary. Um, you know. You're the most rebellious Conservative MP. You certainly were in the, the last Parliament. You voted against the whip over a hundred times. Why do you believe you are out of step with your party's leadership? Well, look, the, we, in the last parliament we had a coalition with the Lib Dems um, and uh, for whatever reason, uh, David Cameron and the party leadership decided that that was the best thing for the Conservative Party and, and it was in the national interest. And that's a, it's a perfectly legitimate position for them to, to hold and, and therefore they felt that in order to deliver that they had to compromise on what they believed in, in order to deliver a truly coalition government. I wasn't elected in, in, in that 2010 election as a coalition MP, I was elected as a Conservative MP. Um, I made certain promises to my constituents about the things that I would campaign on if I was elected to Parliament, uh, and when I was elected to Parliament it would be dishonest of me to say 
at that point to my constituents, oh well I know that I got elected under this particular banner and on this particular mandate, but I'm going to ditch all of that in order to pursue this coalition. All I did really was consistently stand up for the things that I'd argued for before the election. Um, and so it's not really a question of asking me why I was consistent. The, the question really is why so many of my colleagues were prepared to ditch what they'd stood up for to their, before their electorate at the 2010 election. Why do you believe they were willing to ditch? Well, well because they wanted to be in government. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm not an anarchist. I, I believe in governments and people need to be in government and all the rest of it. But, um, you know, I, I've always made it clear that um, I, I would never accept a, a government role. I would always stay on the back benches to argue for what I believed in. So um, I was merely being consistent about the things that I'd always argued for. It was the government that, and the party leadership that had changed its stance on things, not me. You've been called a defender of the privileged by individuals in the press. Why do you think they call you that and how do you respond? I have no idea. I didn't know I was called a defender of the privileged. Um, I'm the most unlikely defender of the privileged, uh, to be perfectly frank. I think there's much more likelier candidates for defending privilege in the Conservative Party in Parliament than me. Um, I don't even consider myself to be from a particularly privileged background. but. Um, I don't know. I, I suspect it's a form of abuse that people hurl at you if they don't agree with you. In the debates over the refugee crisis, you wrote in an email to a constituent, I believe it was a constituent, that it's frankly pathetic to suggest that you can only show you have compassion by thinking we should take everyone who comes here. What do you see as the compassionate response to the refugee crisis uh, and why did you say that? Well, it wasn't a constituent actually, but it, it was a, it was a, um, the compassionate thing to do is to be realistic about what you can deliver. Um, I mean, it, we, you have this ridiculous auction, to be perfectly honest, that goes on, where, uh, when we first started with it, and the Prime Minister said that we weren't going to take anybody, um, the Labour Party said we should take 10,000. Then the Prime Minister announced that we were going to take 20,000, and the same people in the Labour Party said, well, that wasn't enough. So you end, you end up with this situation that whatever you say, for some people, whatever it is, it will never be enough. If we'd have said 100,000, they'd have said it should be 200,000. If we said 200,000, it should have been half a million. You can never appease the people who just, their, their starting point is, you should always do more. My view about what's compassionate is about uh, be, actually giving people some help. People who had already got to Europe were already safe. They were already in a safe country. We can't make them any more safe. Um, so that's just gesture politics. Um, and the other thing is, is that we're already struggling to house people in our own country. I have people coming to my surgeries every single week, struggling to get housed. Um, and so where on earth are we going to find the houses for all of these other people that we're already taking? They don't, they don't exist.